Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this very special Forgotten Feminists episode. Uh, it's very special because I normally have these conversations on Saturdays, but um, I really wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to speak with Delia before the holidays because she is such an amazing, impressive woman. Um, and I really wanted to learn more about her, hear more about her background. As some of you may have read in her bio already, um, Dahlia has had to flee from her country of origin because she spoke the truth about Hamas on October 7th. But I'm going to allow her to get into a lot more detail about that. Um, Dahlia, ahlan, <laughs> marhaban. Ahlan, Yasmin, I'm very excited to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, uh, I look forward like to having a good conversation. Me too. Me too. I really look forward to to learning a lot about you. And I know all these people that have joined uh, probably have a lot of questions for you as well. But let's start at the beginning. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with my background or not, but my mother is also from Egypt. I lived in Egypt for a few years um, and I was just there recently. And so I have, you know, an intimate understanding of what it's like to grow up as a girl in Egypt. And I already knew from seeing you, reading about what you've done, um, I already knew immediately, I'm like, this is a unique woman who must have had a unique childhood. Um, you. uh, you've had a really great quote about your father, which I absolutely loved. I'm going to share it with everybody right now. You said in a tweet, my late father said to me, be the light in the darkness, be the flower in the trash. Everything I am doing in my life is inspired by his words. Regardless of how ugly or dark life gets, you can always find a way to make it better. I I probably, you know, I may be wrong about this, but I, I'm going to probably attribute a lot of who you are today to the fact that you had such a wonderful dad, but I'll let you tell me. Um, tell me about your childhood. What was it like growing up as a young girl in Egypt for you? Uh -huh. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Yes, of course. Like, And thank you for bringing up this quote from my father because it means a lot to me. It literally has been the light guiding me all over the way from the very beginning. Because I remember when I was young, I always adopted this idea of, of being open. Like, you know, as you know, like you said, you know it like firsthand growing up in Egypt is not easy. It's it's a very close society. Growing, growing up as a woman in particular in Egypt is as a girl, as a woman is not easy at all. It's close, a, cl a very closed society contrary to what is being promoted about it. Uh, we are suffering from many social laws and many religious laws that are being imposed on us from the very early years of our lives uh, to be a good girl you have to act in a certain way the society always expected expects you to act in a certain way your family expects you to act in a certain way but so actually I have this rebellious soul in my in my in my heart in my deep inside of me and my father somehow realized this from a very early age and I'm like the stereotype of all of the men in Egypt in general being over controlling and being, you know, this patriarchal mentality, my father was not like that. Despite being uh, a military engineer, he was a military man, you know, but he was not like that at all. He was very open-minded. He was very supportive to me as his eldest child and always proud of me being rebellious against these laws and against these people who are trying to control me and control my will all the time. And I was, I used to complain to him all the time about how bad the people are, how the people are like, you know, want to control me. And so, and he always responded like this, be the flower in the trash. Don't, don't mind what is happening around you. It doesn't, it should not affect you. You should be the flower and turn the whole scene into something beautiful, even if the whole scene is already a trash, you know? So, uh, so he, this, 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 his words remained with me forever for, for until today. And it will remain with me forever and has been guiding me all the way, uh, including when, even when I started activism, I started 
relatively early, like in in high school and then in uh, in uh, the first years of college, uh, I started like to care much about women's rights. I I was mainly fighting against female genital mutilation, which is a horrific practice that's happening in our country and also in some African countries. And this was like my first passion, my main cause, like I have to make it stop from happening. And from there, I started to learn about the great world, about human rights activism. And I started to join human rights organizations and become an activist in hope, like to, to make some change in our society. Then I was able to play a role in the Arab Spring and uh, we were able like to make massive changes happen but soon after we got this big shock of seeing the muslim brotherhood like hijacking our revolution and our work and just becoming the new rulers of egypt at that time honestly this was a big shock for me like i i thought like somehow feel guilty for enabling them somehow to mm. get to this position Although indirectly, of course, like mm -hmm. I didn't do this in purpose. It's completely indirectly. But making this revolution enables the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafists to take over. And they started to like promote or, or to voice things that are very hostile to women in particular, like uh, uh, encouraging child marriage. Not only encouraging, actually, they were discussing legislations to enable like families to marry their girls at nine and eight years old. And, and also making legislations to allow the practice of female genital mutilation, uh, horrific things like this, you know? So I thought, okay, the fight is not over. Let's, let me get involved somehow in getting these people out of power. And I continued my activism and thank God, like the Egyptian people stood up against them and we were able to get rid of them soon after that. Uh, and my fight continued afterwards because I'm a big believer in peace. And I think that if Arab-Israel peace is achieved somehow, it will definitely lead to a better region to will help us get rid of those Islamists, Islamic extremists and the radicals. That's why I continued like, pressuring for this and and participating even on track to uh, initiatives like like uh, people to people conversation dialogues and talks to enable this and make this happen until unfortunately recently when i decide like to speak up against the terrorism of hamas practiced against uh, israeli civilians particularly particularly against the women and the children in israel I was received by by a horrible backlash from my fellow Egyptians, from my fellow Muslims who actually like are now labeling me as a Zionist, as a disbeliever, blasphemy, you know, and accusing me of committing high treason and being a national security to my own homeland, Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's it's really sad, you know. So we oh it, it absolutely is, and we're gonna get into that. Um, but before we talk about that, I wanted to to address a couple of things that you said. Um, first of all, you identified how the Islamists hijacked the Arab Spring, took it over, and were quite successful in taking it over so far that Morsi became the president. So this hijacking of secular or humanist or sometimes left-wing causes, this, this, this idea of Islamists hijacking it is not a new one. It's one that happens all the time. We've seen it all over the Middle East. We've got some people here from Iran um, that are in the call today. Very famously in Iran, that, that's exactly how the Islamic regime of Iran came to power. It was through hijacking a revolution that was started by people that were left-wing secular people. Um, and so they did the same thing in Egypt. And we can see that happening currently, right now. We can see that happening in the streets of New York, all over America, all over Canada, all over Australia, all over the UK. We can see that same alliance going on where the Islamists hijack situations, get themselves involved, make people who are not their allies think that they are allies so that they can infiltrate their cause and then take it over. So, you know, I think it's really important that you've talked about that because there's a lot of people 
that are maybe not familiar with that history and they see this happening in all over the West today and they're very confused. They're like, why are the, why are the left-wing liberals and progressives siding with the Islamists? What's going on? Why are they friends? They're not friends. The Islamists will infiltrate, they will get themselves involved in any cause that's going in the direction that they want it to go where they can get power and they will hijack it and they will eventually take it over. And whoever it was that had initially started this, you know, um, groundswell, this, you know, um, this work towards progress is going to be annihilated when they take over. Um, and I'm really sorry that that happened in Egypt, but we it, it needs to be said that Egypt took care of that immediately. I was so proud of the Egyptian people. I mean, I'm not under any, you know, I, I know how difficult it was and I know how much, um, how many lives were lost and damaged because of it. You know, but it was a very, very necessary thing to do. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood has been trying to get into power in Egypt for decades. And so the fact that they got in then was was really devastating for a lot of us. But of course, it was like the best day for Muslim Brotherhood uh, people all over the world. Um, but thank goodness Egypt was able to get rid of Morsi and um, you guys got back on the right track. Yeah. And now you are, I, I, I want to ask you, um, you did mention that FGM was how you started all of this activism. And I, I have to commend you for that because FGM in Egypt was a huge problem. I think it was close to 90% of girls were mutilated and now it's been criminalized. So that's fantastic. That doesn't mean that it's been eradicated. Of course, you know, it's still happening in secret, but the fact that it has been criminalized is a huge success story because at least it makes it more difficult. It's not normalized, it's not accepted. Um, so thank you so much for your work in that. Um, you know, I have a I have a very personal story connected to, to that. So um, it means a lot to me that you spent cool. so much of your, your time and energy on that very, very important cause. Um, and I just want to plug your book now. You have a book called The Curious Case of the Three-Legged Wolf, Egypt, Military, Islamism, and Liberal Democracy. So I think that that's probably a lot of what we were just talking about right now, that sort of intersection between liberal democracy and Islamists and what is going on here. It is a it is an extremely curious case, Delia. So thank you for writing that book. I'm sure that it'll bring a lot of light to to that discussion. And you're also the director of the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean Studies. Um, now let's go back to October 7th and talk about how you speaking up, stating the truth about what happened in Israel, about what Hamas did in Israel. How has that affected your life? How has that affected your work? Um, but before, actually, before you tell us how it's affected your life and your work, tell us what it was that you'd even said, you know, because now you're being, um, a lot of things are being attributed to you, you know, Delia is this, Delia is that. So I want you to tell us, you know, why you chose to speak up, what it was that you spoke up about, and then how, what was the backlash to that? Yes, wonderful. Uh, thank you, Yasmin. Like a lot of lot of uh, food for thought. What you just mentioned about the Islamists and uh, FGM and October Seven and the curious case of Egypt, of course. Like you know, it's. Uh, but it, believe me, like it's all related. What's happening in Egypt is very much related to what's happening in Israel. Hamas war right now is very much related to what's happening in Sudan and Libya, all over the region, it's all related. And if you look at the at the main source of this, of, of all of these conflicts, you will find out that it is a conflict between Islamists on one side and the secular nation states on the other side. It's like the core, the core, the core of all of these conflicts. Mm -hmm. um, 
Of course, there are like other layers above these conflicts that appear later on, but this is like the base. And I think it, it is also something that the Western world has to be very careful about because this dilemma or this big problem is now being exported to them purposefully mm -hmm. by Islamists. And we can, we can just, anyone can search for this. There is a text written by the Muslim Brotherhood leaders in, in the United States in 1990s. Uh, it's it's now it, it was discovered by federal investigations and now released for public to read. Uh, but in this text, the Muslim Brotherhood had a clear plan about sabotaging the West mm -hmm. from within. One hundred year plan. Exactly to sabotage the West from within, which means that they had a clear vision on what they want to do to make these nation states, successful nation states in the West collapse so they can build their own Islamic caliphate upon the ruins of these nation states. This is what they have been doing in the Middle East for so long, ranging from Iran to its militia all over the region, up to Hamas, up to the Sunni Islamist organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood, ISIS and Al-Qaeda and so on. All their goal is simply just to dismantle the nation states and build their own Islamic caliphate upon this nation state. In the West, they, they adopted the strategy of infiltrating into the Western societies and, and like putting their children who, who would normally be like second generation citizens of these countries into certain groups of influence in these communities so they can promote their ideas. One of these manifestations of this evil plan we are seeing happening right now in reaction to the Israel-Hamas war. All this twisted rhetoric about Hamas being a resistant movement, about being heroes of or a champion of the Palestinian cause, or, and this, this for me is nonsense, nonsense. It has nothing to do with the truth. But this was being told to... Western youth in the United States, in Europe, in universities, everywhere, by their Muslim fellows, by their Islamists, I would say, fellows who are saying this on purpose to promote some lies, to ally them on the, on the side of the evil rather than being on the side of the good. And it's 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 really shocking to see that People in the U.S., for example, in American universities, people who belong, who are women, who are who belong to the LGBT community, are supporting Hamas. They don't even understand that if they live under Hamas and the Sharia law, they will be immediately killed, just for being an LGBT person. You know, it's crazy. It's crazy. So when you see how brainwashed they are you will be shocked, but there is a reason for that, that ha like Islamists has been preparing for this moment for so long. That's why we are seeing this extreme international polarization around the issue. Although it's ethically, it's very clear. We have a group of terrorists who attacked civilian people in their homes on a holiday they attacked people in their pajamas, you know, they raped women, they killed children, they arrested toddlers even and kidnapped them and arrested them for over a month and tortured them. And like, it's it's a clear case. It's It does not even need to argue about. It's a clear case of terrorism. And there is a state responsible about these civilians, and the, which is the Israel state. It reacted like any other state in the world would react when it is faced by a terrorist or when it is attacked by a terrorist organization like Hamas. But actually Hamas twisted the whole rhetoric and made it appear like uh, the Israeli government woke up one day and decided just to uh, kill some Palestinians just out of the blue, just because they think the Palestinian number is increasing. Like, I know it sounds like a joke, but it was said in our media. It was said in the Egyptian media and the Arab media, like by, by, by reputable analysts, you know. At the beginning of, of the massacre and, and the attack by Hamas, 
I was reading the Arab news. I was reading the Egyptian news and watching the Egyptian news. So I thought, like, as they were saying, it was just a clash between uh, Israeli soldiers and Hamas militants, which happen every now and then. So I thought, okay, just another clash. It, it's not a big deal. But then later, I was, like, two days later in particular, I was invited by a video conference in Arabic that was organized by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel and the Ministry of Defense. And it had journalists from all over the Arab world. More than 300 people were attending, journalists, activists, researchers. And they showed us the, the actual footage of what happened, like videos collected from, from the cameras of the houses, from the streets of the kibbutz where the, where the massacre happened and where the music festival was attacked. And they showed us like the real scenes of, of this horrific, horrific attack. And at that time, I felt like anger and I was so offended by the many lies that the Egyptian and the Arab media was promoting about the issue and how they accept, like, to be honest, like, regardless of religious background or nationality or anything, I related to these women who were brutalized and were raped and murdered and mistreated simply because they are Jewish women or because they are Israelis. It's not an excuse. And all these children, you know, even the animals, even the, they killed the animals like dogs and cats, they killed them. They didn't let, they burned houses, they didn't let any sign of life or like it was an attack on humanity this massacre was an attack on humanity not only on the jewish or israeli people it was an attack on humanity so i thought i should stand up and i i have a good following on social media so i thought okay the first place i can do that as long as our media is lying i will go and say the truth and i did that i went and i said the truth and actually of course Expectedly, I received a horrible backlash from the many trolls on social media. And I thought, okay, fine, it will take two or three days and it will go away as usual because it happened to me many times before. But soon after that, I it was picked by the Egyptian media, by the state-sponsored media in Egypt. And by state-sponsored, like it's, it's really state-sponsored, like the state dictates mm -hmm. everything that's being said in these stations. So being attacked by these media stations means the state itself is against me so at the beginning i said okay perhaps this is not the case they made a mistake or something but it became increasing once and again and it's it's increased like the attack is increasing to the extent that some members of parliament appeared on these tv stations to call me a traitor to call me a traitor and, and to call me a threat to Egypt's national security and see the irony here, like someone like me who's a liberal thinker is a threat to Egypt's national security while all the radicals, all the radicals mm -hmm. who are cheering for Hamas and cheering for the Muslim Brotherhood and supporting the Salafists are not a threat to Egypt's national security, which is so ironic, you know. So I... I thought okay it will go over but unfortunately it didn't like i started like to have uh, death threats coming to my phone uh, radical salafist is going to my mother's house and looking for me and mm -hmm. asking like to have my address or my phone number like to kill me and things like that and thank god it went it went well and my mother was not hurt or anything but uh, but it it was really scary. So I contacted people in the authorities in Egypt and I said, guys, I need protection. And their reaction, unfortunately, was like, we're sorry, we cannot protect you. I said, is it because I criticized Hamas? They said, no, not really, but because you said you support Israel in on its war, in its war on Hamas. So the word support Israel for them was the sin that I committed, you know, it was the big crime that I committed. And does they they wouldn't mind seeing me being killed by some fanatic in the street just because I said I support Israel, which is crazy, because Egypt has a peace treaty with Israel that has been in place ah. for years. You know, I was just gonna say that, and it's supposed to be a secular country. So law enforcement is choosing to not help a, an Egyptian citizen because they disagree with your 
ideas. They just, you're, you are, a, you're now you've committed the crime of wrong think. And so yeah. law enforcement refuses to protect you against death threats. Unfortunately, true. Yes. And the thing is that in Egypt, yes, we have a peace treaty with Israel. Yes, we have very good relationship with Israel over the past seven years of economic cooperation, military cooperation and everything. But unfortunately, when it comes to the deep state in Egypt, they still carry a lot of hatred toward this Israel. Some of them call still up till today, they still call Israel the historical enemy of Egypt. And up till today, every year we celebrate the anniversary of the war with Israel in 1973. Mm -hmm. But we don't celebrate the anniversary of the peace treaty, which was amazing. Until today, President al-Sadat, who made the peace treaty with Israel, is being criticized for what yeah. he did and, and being seen as a traitor, although in my opinion, he was a hero. So, yeah. so as you can see, like the deep state in Egypt is still a very big problem when it comes to peace with, with Israel or peace in general. And they are also still a problem when it comes to democratization and human rights, as, as we all know. So uh, so the thing is that, yes, I, uh, so actually after that, I was invited to an interview with uh, INSS, the Institute of National, of National Security Studies, to comment on the issue. I didn't say, like, of course, like my words were taken afterwards to, be, to appear like I, I am encouraging Israel to kill the Palestinians and I hate the Palestinians. Of course not. Of course, I'm completely against the killing of any civilians, regardless of their background. They are all humans. And of course, I sympathize with the Palestinian people who are going through all this suffering right now. But at the same time, we have to like set the truth clear, to, to be clear about where the truth is, who caused this suffering to both the Israelis and the Palestinians. It's Hamas, mainly it's Hamas. So, so, so this is what I said, and I said, like, I am 100% supporting Israel in its war on Hamas, and I believe that if Hamas is removed, this will be good, Hamas and the other terrorist organizations, this will be good for the entire region, and I called upon Arab countries, including my country, Egypt, to, to support Israel in this war for the good of the region. Of course, like my words were like taken in a completely different direction. The video of the interview went viral, and I started like unfortunately some law, uh, some some lawyers in Egypt who are also very close to the state used this interview to file legal claims against me, accusing me of high treason and uh, threatening Egypt's national security and they're cooperating with Zionist organizations, like a number of accusations that each one of them could put me in jail for, for the rest of my life, you know? So it's, uh, so right now I had, unfortunately, unf I had to live with a broken heart. I had to leave my country where I lived my whole life. And right now I'm in a, in a different country and uh, like, not sure about what will happen next in my life, trying to rebuild my life from scratch again. But the only thing I am so determined to keep and to keep using is my voice, because I think this is the main goal of the Islamists is from the beginning, like, you know, to silence me and silence the people like me. So this is the one thing that I will not let them get uh, any time, any time, no, even even if it would cost me my whole life, I will keep speaking against them and I will keep fighting against them. That's wonderful, Dahlia. I, I commend you. I'm in awe of you. I appreciate you. I'm grateful for you. It is, it, it's unbelievable how speaking the basic facts, speaking, speaking truth and logic can be considered high treason. Um, but this is what happens when you're when you're part of this Islamist cult and you are compelled to lie, you are compelled to keep the lie going. Um, you know, and the truth is, it's such a duplicitous situation because these governments hate Islamists. These governments don't want these terrorists there. You know what I mean? Like they they do you think right now Israel is is surrounded by Arab countries 
Do you think that if they had a problem with them attacking Hamas, that they wouldn't do something about it? They're happy Israel is doing their dirty work. They would love to remove the terrorist organizations from all of their company, from all of their countries and the Islamists as well, um, because it's a threat to their national security. It's a threat to their power. You know, that that's why the Muslim Brotherhood are considered a terrorist organizations in so many Muslim majority countries, right? Like Saudi Arabia and UAE and Bahrain and whatever, because these are, you know, these Islamists will be a threat to their monarchy. And they don't, they don't want them, of course. So they want to get rid of Hamas, but they pretend that they have to, because they have to play the cult game and they have to all pretend, oh no, we're, we're supporting them because they, they're working towards the, uh, the caliphate that we all want, you know, like it's, it's an absolute, you know, it's just, it's duplicitous. It's, it's, it's just a big lying game. You know, I want to take one moment just because I'm not sure who could be listening to this. And I just want to take one minute to make a distinction here because we keep on using the word Islamists. And I just want to make sure that we offer some sort of definition. So the reason why we're saying Islamists and not Muslims. Um, so I'll leave it to you, Dahlia, to, to give a little bit of a definition of the of the word Islamists, who we're talking about exactly when we use that word. Yeah, thank you, Yasmin, for your notes. And actually, yes, but before I get to this, uh, to the definition of Islams, I just want to very quickly comment on the situation of the Arab states. Yes, 100%, I agree with you. All the Arab, st all the Arab states right now uh, that exist right now, they want to get rid of the Islamists. And at the beginning of the war, they were happy to see Israel doing this to Hamas. They kind of turned their heads away until mm -hmm. Israel finishes the dirty work of finishing Hamas. But then the things escalated to a big level of like, you know, like all these news coming from Gaza about being people being killed. And so created an outrage in the Arab streets and made outrage that is added to the anger that already existed from before because of the mispractices of these leader of the of the leaders of the Arab countries. For example, in countries like Egypt and Jordan, there is already a severe economic crisis happening. So the people are already angry against their leaders because of these economic crises. So add to this, like the outrage coming from the Israel Hamas war and the news coming from Gaza, this acted as a threat to these leaders. So they wanted they that they were forced later on to play along what the street wants, what the public wants, by changing the rhetoric from supporting Israel to now supporting Hamas, calling about the calling them the heroes who are resisting for Palestine and so, and uh, liberating Al Aqsa Mosque and all these uh, lies and these slogans. And then they had to play along, just not because they really believe in this, but they had to do so to protect their own seats, to protect themselves. So th this led to what we are seeing now. And I think somehow I was used as a scapegoat in this in this game, yeah. unfortunately, to to for the Egyptian state to have this image somehow. So uh, uh, that actually, um, uh, what I was going to say, yeah, you were you were asking about the Islamists and how different they are from the Muslims. I am a Muslim myself, but despite that, I'm standing up against the Islamists. The moderate Muslims, the ordinary Muslim people know that Islam is an individual religion. It's mainly about your relationship with God. It's not about forcing other people to be Muslims or or even if someone who's a Muslim and leaves Islam, you call them murtad and you want to kill them. For the Islamists, the issue is different. For the Islamists, it's political. It's mainly political. It's a matter of how big our cult is and uh, how they are always defensive and they represent themselves as if they are defending God or defending mm -hmm. the name of God. And under this title of defending the name of God, they just fight for themselves to kill people who are not Muslims, to suppress, or even people who are Muslims, but who are go, who go against them, to suppress women, 
to do horrible practices in the society simply because they call it like the virtue or spreading virtue or, you know, like, for example, FGM, we were just talking about f female genital mutilation. It's practiced in our countries under the name of religion, as if it is a practice that you have to cut this piece from the girl's body. So when she grows up into a woman, she will not be practicing vice in the society. She will not be attractive to men and she will not be practicing vice and then the society will be good. The same thing about hijab, by the way, also. Like many people in a very young age, like force the girls in a very young age to wear this hijab just because they think this way they are protecting the whole society and preventing men from being attracted to women, so committing vice and so on. This all is in the minds of the Islamists, the extremists, but not in the minds of the ordinary Muslims who just live just an ordinary life. And someone like me, I'm a Muslim, but I call myself a liberal as well. I, I adopt liberal values and I don't see them contradicting in any way with, with me being religious, you know. So it's somehow it, it needs a balance that the Islamists does not have. But the sad news is that the Islamists are now leading the public opinion. Yes. They have been trying to do this for a while, and now they are succeeding to lead the public opinion because of the war that's happening right now. And what Hamas, Hamas created kind of a momentum for them to rise up again from under the ground after being suppressed by the Arab countries in the past, uh, the Arab countries that fought against them in the past uh, 10 years or so, now they are rising once again and they are leading the public opinion. And I, I, I will not be surprised to see the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis coming to power again in the coming years or so. Well, I hope not. Um... But, you know, I I want to talk about what's going on in the West a little bit because that distinction that you made between Islamists and Muslims is an important one. And the reason why it is such a um, contentious issue in the West is because, as you said, the Islamists are the ones that are leading the conversation. The Islamists are the ones with power. They're the ones with Qatari money. They're the ones with the microphones. They're the ones with the ability to pay the campaign funds to get whoever they want in power. They're the ones with the ability to start up all of these different media groups and think tanks and nonprofits. And they now act in the West as if what they are saying is the voice of the Muslims. So it's Islamists that are speaking, but they have organizations like in Canada, it's called the National Council of Canadian Muslims. It's not Canadian Muslims, it's Canadian Islamists, but they right. pretend that they're speaking for all Muslims. And so what ends up happening is first and foremost, the governments see them as, okay, if you are the voice of the Muslims, then we have to follow what it is that you're saying if we want the Muslim vote. So they are swaying votes towards what the Islamists want to happen. And then, of course, it's affecting public opinion of Muslims as well, because they're seeing the Islamist group doing, doing all sorts of deplorable things, and they're calling themselves Canadian Muslims or American Muslims, you know, like CARE, another organization in the U.S., right? And so it makes the public think, what is with these Muslim people? They are just a bunch of crazies that are trying to push their religion on the rest of us. You know, why can't they just practice their religion in their mosques or in their homes quietly? Why do they have to come out and 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 pray in the middle of the streets, you know, in the middle of Times Square and do all of the things they're doing in the middle of airplane aisles? You know, these are shows of force. This is even this is even against their own religion. There's even a hadith that tell them not to do that. They're defying their own religion by inconveniencing people. I've seen people in Turkey praying in the middle of traffic. <laughs> buses and cars and trucks are going around them because they want to pray in the middle of traffic. That's I mean, it's absolute 
nonsense. But but people see that and they just see, oh, those are the the Muslims. So they're not they're not doing any favors for the average normal, you know, open minded liberal thinking Muslims in all of the Western world. They are making things so much harder for them. Um, but they're making things easy for themselves, though, because they are spreading their Islamist ideology in media, in government, in all in all of the places that matter. Right. Exactly. Referring back to this hundred year plan that they have yeah. everything. Check, check, check. They're doing everything that they want to do on it. The first thing it says is that we're going to without raising a sword. You know, they don't believe in uh, in jihad like the. Um, you know, like Hamas, Al-Qaeda, like all those terrorists, right? They're going to do it peacefully. They're going to do it, A, through the wombs of the Muslim mothers, so through making babies, right? And so that their numbers can increase and so that they can, um, at that point, sway the political opinion. And they're going to use secular laws against themselves, which they do all the time. And... It's, it's left my brain now with the third. Oh, and through immigration. Immigration was the third way as well. Um, yes. So they're doing they're doing everything that they promised to do, and they're actually quite successful at it. And the reason why they're so successful in the West is because there is no differentiation. They People don't understand the difference between a Muslim and an Islamist. And so they they are fooled when the Islamists come and they say, oh, you can't do that because it's Islamophobic. You can't yeah. say that because it's Islamophobic, you know, you can't show these paintings in the classroom and you can't have these discussions. People think, oh, we can't do that because we're going to offend the Muslims. And they don't realize, no, you are being led by a militant extremist group, but yes. they don't recognize they don't, don't recognize that difference. So I'd like some advice from you because I know that this is your area of expertise. So speaking to the people in the West right now. What can we do to save ourselves? You know, like, what can we do to understand the predicament that we're in with Islamists? And and what can we do at this point? Yeah, thank you so much, Yasmin. It's, uh, it's yes, speaking about the Islamist ideology in the West, the Islamists did not only, are not only pushing their ideologies, but it seems like they have studied the Western societies very well, and yes. they... We know exactly what they're doing by abusing the open space of free speech, of freedom in the Western societies to their advantage. The same way, for example, we've seen them abusing democratization and the dream for democracy in the countries of the Arab Spring, like Egypt and Tunisia. They did exactly the same thing in the West. The Western societies are open societies in countries like Canada and the United States. They are very diverse. There are people from different backgrounds. Uh, in Europe, it's very cultural countries, very historical, very like uh, deeply rooted into civilization. So they know exactly how these societies are thinking and how much they value things like human rights, freedom of speech, and so. So, so they abuse this space to say, okay, we're just promoting or just we're speaking up for our religion or saying things about Islam and so until they reach the point of establishing themselves as speakers in the name of all Muslims. And also, unfortunately, because in these Western societies, there is no much education about other countries like the Arab world, the Islamic world, and so people think that these are the Islamists, like these ugly, evil faces are the faces of the, Islam of the Muslims. But actually, no, they are the faces of the Islamists who have an agenda and have a goal that they want to achieve by abusing the open space in these societies. And one of their tools, actually, which contradicts with their abuse of this open society or the openness and the freedom in these Western societies is the promotion of the idea of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Because... The, the people in the West should not fall for this lie. I, I don't say like Islamophobia does not exist. Yes, it exists, of course, like any other 
type of, of phobia, but it's not as severe and as big as the Islamists are trying to portray it. The Islamists are trying to make it appear like a, a holocaust against Muslims or that all the Western world is so united against like hurting all the Muslims. Okay, and this, fine, you are using the space for free speech in the West as Islamists is to promote your evil ideas and no one is punishing you for this. But when the Western side uses this free speech to protest these evil ideas you're promoting, in their own way, I mean, by make, making a caricature, making a, a publishing an article or something, you just go against them very angry and say, oh, this person is Islamophobic, this person hates Islam. No, this person hates you as Islamists. He hates your evil thought. He does not hate Islam because these countries still have very good relationship with all Muslim countries. And even someone like me, when I travel to Western countries, I, I'm always welcomed by friends. I've never been stopped by any Western country, by the way, just for being a Muslim or something. I, I travel so easily. Uh, I, have all, I have great friends from all religions, from religious backgrounds. I mean, in these Western countries, but yes, what the people in the West hate are the practices of the Islamists. And they have all the right to protest these practices in their own way. Because to be honest, it's, it, it, it appears like an invasion to these Western societies, especially in Europe. If, if you have been living for, for centuries, adopting a similar set of ideologies and similar set of beliefs, social beliefs, I'm not speaking about religious beliefs, or a mindset, and then someone all of a sudden infiltrates into this society, an Islamist, I would say, and rather than merging into this civilization they are getting to, they are holding to their beliefs that are coming from a foreign country, and not even that, they are trying to impose it on the people who are living in these countries. So this is this is the core of the problem. This is the main problem here. And this is why Islamists are giving a very bad image about Muslims everywhere in the world and how they are playing this game of Islamophobia, you know? And th like the West should be very, very careful about this. What the people in the West need to do, first of all, education, education, either to educate themselves about what Islam is, what the Muslims are, what the Arab world is actually, and how the Arabs are thinking, the tribal dimension of Arab politics and all that, to educate themselves about this. So they create, educate themselves and educate their friends, families, and so about all of that. So they create some kind of an immune system against mm -hmm. these Islamists when they try like to do things in, in their communities, in their societies that is against logic, against common sense, they can stand up against them and say, what you're doing is wrong. The same way, for example, people in the Middle East right now, including me and people like me, who are standing, and you, Yasmin, who are standing up against Islamists. It's not because we are Islamophobic, obviously. We are not Islamophobic. We are standing against these evil ideas, this evil ideology that they are trying to promote as being Islam. So, so that's what because why we do this because we experience experience it at first hand. We know how mm -hmm. horrific it is, how terrible it is. The people in the West don't know that, so they need to be educated about that. And I think perhaps it's our mission too, like people coming from these regions. As I think, like your program here is so wonderful that you are educating the people and you are already doing this. You're educating the people in the West about these bad groups and bad people and 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 that giving them hope also that there are perhaps women in the region and worldwide that can that can really make a difference and be a threat to those islamists you know i'm doing the best i can and i know obviously dahlia you are doing amazing work as well and there are a lot of liberal secular muslims who are doing important work but it's important to note, somebody asked in the chat here, where are the Muslim liberal organizations, where are the liberal Muslim organizations? 
you know, look at what Delia is going through right now by just talking about what Hamas did in Israel. I mean, we have video evidence. They had their own GoPro cameras recording what they were doing. She is merely stating reality. She's stating facts. And look what's happened to her. So, you know, when we talk about these Islamist organizations, it's important to remember they have the billions of dollars of funding from Iran. They have the petrodollars from Qatar, right? They have the backing of states like Turkey. These are the Islamist organizations, the Islamist money that, pro, you know, prop up the people that they want to prop up. Liberal Muslims don't have that, right? Moderate Muslims, um, progressive thinking Muslims, they don't have that. Where they should have it is from the West, right? We can't expect any Muslim majority countries. Uh, currently, right now, there are no democratic, progressive Muslim majority countries who would be willing to support people like Dahlia. You know, Tunisia is kind of like eh, on the cusp, but even Tunisia is a tragedy. Okay. So where she should be getting support is America, Canada, Germany, Sweden. These are the countries that need to be elevating her voice and, and people like her and creating, helping to create and boost these liberal Muslim organizations. Uh, because right now there's no contest. There's absolutely no contest with the petrodollars and what the the Islamists have behind them versus the liberal Muslims who are basically, you know, running for their lives most of the time. Because speaking up against the mainstream, especially when the mainstream are terrorists, is very dangerous work. And even if people feel it in their heart and feel it in their mind, very few are going to be as brave as Dahlia and speak out and be willing to lose their jobs, be willing to lose their livelihoods, be willing to, she can't be in the same country with her mother right now, you know what I mean? The country that she was born and raised in and lived in her whole life, she has to flee it. That's a huge price to pay. And it's not a price that most people would be willing to pay, you know, it, it, it's understandable. It's understandable that people would just keep their mouths shut because it, it, it's dangerous. Um, so the, the sad truth is a lot of those Muslim organizations don't exist. Some of them do in the West. I'm the co-founder of one with Dr. Zudi Jasser from the U.S. Um, and our organization is called the Clarity Coalition. So you can look up claritycoalition.org. That's one of the organizations that exist. But, you know, we are not, <laughs> compared to CARE, for example, or the National Council of Canadian Muslims or, or ISNA or all these other very funded organizations, we're grassroots. We're doing the best we can. But, um, you know, these dissenting voices are in, are in danger, you know, um, and they are little whispers. And unfortunately, the people who are in power in the West are going to the Islamists and supporting them and elevating them instead of going to the liberal minded and progressive Muslims and elevating their voices, uh, which is what should be happening and which is what I hope will start happening now when they start to get some clue. Because Dahlia, you're absolutely correct that a lot of it has to do with ignorance. It's the second largest religion on the planet. There's 57 Muslim majority countries. This is not a minority. You know, you guys should be aware a little bit. <laughs> have an idea of, of what it is that we're talking about, please, you know, get educated. It's important. But they think, oh, that's none of our business. That's over there. That's not over here. It's here. It's in your backyard. It's happening in your neighborhoods. You know, the Islamists are everywhere. So it, it behooves you, behooves everybody to pay attention to what's going on right now. And if the right people are paying attention and making the right movements in the right directions, then I hope that voices like yours, Delia, will be elevated over the voices of the Islamists that have overtaken so many of our institutions in the West, inshallah. Well, hopefully, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to open it up to uh, a group discussion right now. Um, so since we've got such a huge amount of people here today, I'm going to ask that you please... If you go down to the bottom there, there's a little reactions button. Um, and if you could just raise your hand 
And then I will know that you want to ask Dahlia a question. And in the meantime, Dahlia, I'm going to, before we start going to the people that are raising their hands, I'm just gonna ask you a question that's in the chat here. Mm -hmm. um, the question is from someone named Joshua. It says the Quran and Hadiths have very unpleasant and violent views towards Jews, Christians, and infidels. One could think that they are fulfilling the will of Allah and the prophet of Allah and the, by merely expressing what is written. While the Bible isn't much better in terms of violence and backwardness, am I right in suggesting that much of the problem is the comparatively high degree of literalism and orthodoxy? And if so, how do we get, how do we educate people to get past that? So just to clarify. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was no, going to no, clarify, I, but if it's clear to you, then you go ahead, Dahlia. The question's it's, for it's you. Clear, actually, but it's, it's a very, very good question because it has been asked a lot because I think there is a history of uh, of uh, yani where these texts, these extremist texts are coming from, uh, encouraging uh, hatred between most all Muslims and all Jews is mainly for political reasons. It's coming from uh, the history of conflict between Jewish tribes and Muslim tribes at the very early uh, years of Islam in Mecca, in, in, you know, in Hejaz, where the land we are calling today Saudi Arabia, I mean, at this very early time, there were political conflicts between these tribes. So, uh, of course, like all, all political conflicts, to make them appear legitimate, you have to give them a religious layer or a social layer, like a justification. And this is exactly what happened. Uh, and led to the creation of these texts in Quran and Hadith and so. And then later on, when this conflict was renewed, when Israel uh, was established in the region and people needed an excuse to fight against Israel, I mean, certain states and certain countries needed an excuse to do that. They brought these texts back and introduced to the public once again and tried to spread once again as an excuse, like to renew this Muslim Jewish war. But I agree with you, Joshua, like, of course, education needs to be ha to happen that what happened in the past is a different story. Now we are living in a different reality. Israel is already part of the region. It's not a foreign body, as they are saying. It's already part of the region. Most of the Jewish people in Israel today, more than 60% of the Israeli population in Israel today, were Jewish people in Arab countries. And they were pushed from these Arab countries to Israel in the 1950s and the 1960s among the big campaign of discrimination against the Jewish people. So actually, these are Middle East Eastern people. Why being Israel away from Israel, from the Middle East is not even an option. And it's nonsense to think about and for anyone to think about this happening. So. So we have this now we are in a different reality than it was thousands of years ago at the time of the Prophet Muhammad or so. So it, we have, of course, we will need to be educated about this, but again, it will take a lot of time. Thank you, Dahlia. Okay, so let's move on to Mohand. Mohand, please go ahead and mute yourself and ask your question, Adelia. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Yasmin, for continuing your uh, unwavering advocacy as usual. And thank you, Dahlia, for sharing your experience. I really bow to your determination and courage for calling out Hamas, you. your knowledge and analysis of the Islamism ideology. That said, you have completely confused me today. There is a complete contradiction between what you say, what you do, and the image that you portray by wearing the hijab on your head, which is the flag of the Islamists. It's their territory marker for the advancement of Islamism, in particular in Western countries. Can you please explain? 
with all sure. due respect. Thank you, Muhammad, and uh, thank you for your kind words. And yes, I understand it may be confusing sometimes for people like to see a liberal Muslim who uh, does not um, push her religion on others, but at the same time, she's practicing this religion. And I think like, as I was saying earlier, Islam, in my opinion, is like any other religion. It's like an individual thing, an individual relationship between one person and God. It's the way you relate to this superpower called God. In in in, and it has different names in in different religions and different ways of practicing this. Uh, but actually, also, if if I I like, I want to highlight your point when you said like it's. Hijab is seen as a flag of of uh, the Islamists, the extremists. Yes, this could be the perception of many people in the West, but this is not the truth. They also, again, took something good and turned it into something bad. The Islamists, I mean, they took something ordinary, something normal, like a practice of religion and turned it into something bad. Exactly like prayer, the, like the... A prayer to God, when you pray to God, you're praying to God to connect with God. But they took that, and as Yasmin was just telling the story of people like praying in the middle of airports, in the middle of the traffic, and these crazy practices are done by Islamists just to emphasize their points. Again, they took something good, something spiritual, and turned it into something bad. So actually, the confusion is somehow coming from the side of the Islamists, and perhaps also we need like again, to do more education about what true Islam is so people, so when people in the Western communities like see people like me will not be, you know, like confused or, or scared or anything when understanding that there is a difference between Muslims and Islamists. Thank you, Dalia. Um, um, Mohand, I'm going to have to move on because there's a lot of people sure, waiting. Sure, but I just want sure. to express Thank that um, every individual can make their own personal religious choices. And that's part of the reason why, you know, that that's that's the difficulty that it was for me as a Muslim, was that I was being forced to do things that I didn't want to do. And so I will never enforce upon other people or judge other people for the choices that they're making. And that's the problem that Delhi and I have with Islamists as well. You, you are correct that they have made it their flag by creating things like hijab day and stuff like that. But that's because with hijab day, they're trying to enforce the hijab on everybody else, including on non-Muslims. And that's, that's the difference here. The problem isn't women who decide to wear it, the problem is when it is being decided for them. Um, so I just wanted to, to share my own uh, insight into that. But thank you for that question, Mohand. Richard, you're next. Sorry, you're muted. I'm going to just leave you for a second, Richard, and move on to Kate. Um, and then hopefully you can get your microphone working. Okay, Kate, go ahead. Hi, it's nice to see you guys. Hi, Dahlia. Nice to meet you. It's been really, really interesting to hear what you have to say. So thank you so much. I realize that you're doing this at enormous risk. Um, so what I wanted to ask you actually is kind of, you know, some bigger picture stuff because you're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and their 100 year plan. Now, back in the 20th century, there were some great thinkers, you know, when they were discussing the Nazi problem, because I guess a lot of the leaders, they didn't really know how to deal with them at first. And um, Karl Popper, he wrote, unlimited tolerance must lead to the disappearance of tolerance. If we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, if we are not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and tolerance with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was another great thing that Winston Churchill said, uh, which kind of sums up the same thing. He said, an appeaser is one who feeds a crocodile, hoping it will eat him last. <laughs> So what are your thoughts about how the West should deal with the problem of Islam? 
Oh, it's uh, okay. Thank you for the great quotes first. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> very inspiring and needs like a lot of deep thinking uh, to understand their deep meanings. Yeah, what what the West should do with the Islamists? You mean like? Yes. So first of all, yeah. first of all, don't let them abuse this space of free speech in the way they are doing right now. There is, there has to be clear distinction between what is free speech and what is a threat to other groups. When they, for example, make protests calling for the genocide of the Jews in American universities, this is not free speech. This is hatred, this is hate crime and, and should be punished. When they attack people under, under the claim of being like, I don't know, Islamophobic or, things like that, they should, there should be a clear punishment to this, and the West should not shy from doing that. The other thing which we discussed, I think, during our, our talk is very, very important education. Education of people, education of oneself, education of families, about Islam, about the Arab world, about, about this mysterious land, you know, that exists not very far away from the West, but it's full of complications and conflicts. And why these conflicts are happening, it's all related. It's all related somehow. And now with the massive number of immigrants like leaving the Arab world and going to the West, this should also be like kept in mind very clearly, you know, I mean, should should like as Yasmin said, it's the the Islamists are not there anymore they are here in the yeah. west yeah. thank you dahlia uh richard can we check in how's your microphone going can you hear me yes we can hallelujah <laughs> um, first of all i just want to thank you for your courage um i've sure. spent a lot of time uh in iran pakistan I've been involved in um, um, uh, some projects in Afghanistan to get women back into the workplace. Um, and now I live half of my year in Dubai. Oh. Which, as we know, is um, a Sharia, a Sharia um, government uh, country, although it's a very light touch. Um, we, yes, the Islamists are here. Um, the barbarians are not at the gate. They are inside the wall, clearly. And I've been saying this to my family uh, for the last 20-odd uh, years. We're going to have a very... I'm actually in, in Austria at the moment. All my family are going to be here and all the grandkids. And we've got very different political views. So there's going to be some, some heated discussions about this uh, over Christmas. Um, we are tolerant in the West. Um are we too tolerant and should we become uh, less tolerant and uh, to, to, to eradicate um, what's happening to our society? And should we be sending people home when they express um, these horrific uh, views? Um, and there is particularly in England, they're here in my country and I'd I'd put them on the I'd put them on the first plane, I'd put them on the first plane home. I mean, we've got we've got Hamas leaders here living in um, council houses. Mm. What the hell is going on? Absolutely, actually, I agree with you. You know what? The, what is really ironic also is that you would you'll find people speaking about Pakistan, Iran, and like. Uh, East Asian countries, you'll find people from these countries very sympathetic with Hamas right now, yeah. although actually, and very hostile to Israel, although in reality, there is no history of conflict between their countries and Israel in any way. So if it happens in the Arab world, okay, we say there is a history of conflict between Israel and Arabs, we can understand it from this angle. But when you look at the Pakistanis and all the people who are cheering for Hamas, from these countries, you will be surprised. It's mainly for them an Islamic thing. They are an is like an Islamic support or some some kind of this uh, extremist ideology is motiva motivating them to do that. But 
Whether the West should stand up against these Islamist voices, I think it is necessary for the good of all. But the West should also do this in like without with breaking the law or taking extreme measures. It has to be very smart in order not to backfire against the Western countries that are trying to do this. Like, for example, if someone who has already practiced terrorism or expressed uh support to a terrorist organization should immediately leave these countries leave the western countries absolutely absolutely because this person is now adopting a terrorist ideology and you would expect them in a minute being turned into a terrorist themselves if they if they think it is the right thing now sooner or later they will carry a knife and go on stabbing people just because they are jewish for example or they are christian or whatever just because they are different from him. So if someone supported this terrorist ideology and adopted this, yes, like legal measures should be taken towards these people. And this is one thing. The other thing is that for, for I would say, the general public Muslims in the Muslim communities in the West who are deceived by this rhetoric, I think it's important not to leave the mosques for other countries to lead. In France, for example, I know many mosques are being led by, by the Turks. So what do you think right now, what the Turkish imams in these mosques are telling the Muslims in France or in these European countries that in the mosques that they are leading, of course they are fueling them with a lot of hate and portraying Hamas as like champions of Islam and of the Palestinian cause and so. So they are spreading lies in these mosques. There, there must be state, uh, observe, uh, state supervision and monitoring of these mosques in the West. Don't leave them just for, most, for other countries to lead. It's, it's very dangerous. And the other thing is education, education for these Muslim communities, communicating with them. Don't, I mean, I'm, I'm now speaking about like the regular Muslims, the moderate Muslims who exist in these communities, why they join these extremist Islamists? Because, you know, when they are in a foreign country, they want to belong somehow. And like, you know, the Muslim students in American universities, for example, they feel strange among their colleagues. So if some Islamist organization affiliated to the Muslim Brotherhood or so, like ISNA and others, like come to them and say, come to us, spend like Eid celebration with us, like religious celebrations with us, they start to create this bond with them. But okay, actually Western countries where these Muslim youth exist or Muslim communities exist, they can open the space for the moderates to practice these things in, in a way that does not offend the society first and offend, I mean, the culture of the society they exist in and encourage them to merge into this society, like the bigger Western society, rather than be having this gap that allows them or pushes them to belong to these Islamist extremists. And also, again, it's a work that requires a year to happen, but it's better to start as soon as possible. Is it the um, is it the Quran or the Hadith that says um, thou shalt not befriend the infidel? The who should befriend the infidel? It's either the Quran or the Hadith, and I don't know which it is that says you mustn't make friends with an infidel. With Jews and I... Christians, it's Quran. But I'm it's sorry, Quran. Richard. I'm gonna move. Yeah. I'm gonna move on to well, the yeah, next because yeah, okay. we've got people going. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Question. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dahlia, for your response as well. Sarah, you're next. Hi. Hi. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Sorry, Yasmin. Thank you for acknowledging Iran when it comes to these conversations because a lot of times people don't talk about the role that the Islamic regime plays in wreaking havoc and creating absolute evil because that's what they do. I appreciate it. And Dahlia, I appreciate your courage for talking about this. I appreciate your faith. I appreciate that despite everything that you went through, you are still defending your religion and I understand it and I respect it. 
but and I I hate to sound contrarian here. Yasmin knows I come from Iran and I suffer from PTSD. And the distinction that you and Yasmin make between Islamists and Muslims, I don't have that privilege because where I come from, that doesn't exist. And it hasn't been in my experience. And I try, I really try because everybody has the right to lead their own lives. If I don't believe in anything, that's my right. Just the same way, it's your right to believe in whatever you want. But you talk about education, you talk about the line, you talk about how terrorists should be turned back where they come from. But where do you draw that line between the Islamists and Muslims? Because I understand that anti-Muslim bigotry exists, but Islamophobia is just a tool to silence the rest of us. I suffer from Islamo trauma. My fear is very rational because I've seen what happens to people. People have been murdered in the past year just because they don't want to be Muslims anymore. They just want to cover their hair. Women have been raped and blinded. About 20,000 people were imprisoned in Iran. So for me, where do you draw the line? That's my question. Because right now they are playing Iran in Western countries. And there are videos on, on Twitter sometimes or YouTube. or Insta. And it's just, for me, it's a fear of, oh, my God, they're here. Oh, my God. Oh, that fear. This is something very simple. You have the right to practice your religion. But that, for me, is triggering. And I think I have to write not to face that five times a day. So mm -hmm. I know it's very limiting, but that's my question. You talk about education. How do you educate the people whose holy book, you said that it's old books, but it's real in reality, it's in the, Quran, in the Quran that talks about all these things that cause problems for us. That you have to hate the Jews, that you do not become friends with uh, Christians, that you have to kill ex-Muslims. I can't go anywhere in the Middle East because they will kill me. My, I can't go back to my own country. I can understand, yeah. So for me, where do you draw the line between Islamists and Muslims? Because moderate Muslims are as guilty as me. They will be murdered when they go to any of this. Somebody in the chat asked where, which one is the liberal country or a progressive. We don't have them. No. So does yeah. that mean that in reality we cannot have them? Is that something that this book has not been revolutionized? It's still belonging to the seventh century. And I don't want to enforce my fear and my trauma and my pain onto other people. But for me, you have a mosque, go in and pray inside the mosque. Why do you have to blast that Adhan? Why do you have to pray outside on the street? Because that, for me, that's a sign of intimidation. Definitely. Yeah, I agree. So with I would you. like to know your opinion. Where do you draw the line when you say, send them back? Send who back? Like, how far do we go? People who still believe in polygamy, because it's part of the Quran. There is a surah in Nessa that says you can have two, three, four wives. You can't just pick and choose. Bagara 85 says you cannot pick and choose from the word of God. You have to follow everything. And yes, we have to revol revolutionize this religion, but how do you do that when there's so much pushback? Yeah, thank you, Sara. And uh, I understand where you come from. I understand uh, your pain and your suffering and what you've seen very well. And actually, I use this opportunity to uh, applaud for the Iranian women for their amazing stand up against. Uh, the Mullah regime, the very cruel Mullah regime and the hardliners in Iran who used um, Islam as a tool to suppress women and used Islamic teachings as a tool to suppress women, which, but thank God, like the Iranian women are, are so strong. They are they're standing up really strong and they will keep the fight. And in my opinion, they are fighting on behalf of all of us, of all of us, either in the Arab world, in the Middle East, in the Islamic world. They are fighting on behalf of all of us. Where we can, Iran also, speaking about Iran before I speak, where we can draw the line is Iran actually, If I think, I believe in this uh, conspiracy theory, if I would say, that says that Iran is behind the, the current Israel-Hamas war. Because if you think about it, like two days before uh, this war started and the massacre happens, there was a negotiation about a deal of peace deal between... Six billion dollars. 
$6 exactly. million. Dollars. Yes, yes. Exactly, you see? So there was a deal already between, uh, a negotiation about a deal already between uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel for reconciliation and for normalization. But Iran decided to intervene at this moment by creating this, by making this massacre happen, by, by inciting Hamas to commit this, these crimes and turn the situation into once again a situation that making peace with any Arab country impossible for Israel. Why? Because it serves Iran interests. So this is this is part of the politics that is going on in the region. Speaking about where we draw the line, I think the main distinction between the person who is a moderate Muslim and who is like, like uh, what I call it, like an extremist, an Islamist, uh, a terrorist, a threat to the Western states and, the, and to humanity, a threat to humanity in general, is the person who uses his religion as an excuse to practice violence or who abloses the, the, this practice of violence. But for some person who practice their religion individually without forcing it on, on other people, okay, so everyone is free to do whatever they want as long as it is within their individual limits. Without, if, especially, and if you are a Muslim and you choose to travel to a Western country, you don't have the luxury of insisting on like, you know, pushing your religion on other people and just claiming that it is okay because this is how your religion is or using like twisted texts from your 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 uh, holy text from your holy book or so to force uh, certain concepts on the society you're going to. As an individual in this society, you should merge into the society that you are going into, merge into its values because you've chosen to go to this society to immigrate to this society. So you should not like force your values on this society, but merge into the values, merge yourself into the values of these of these societies. If if the people, if like the Muslim people in the West can do this, okay, fine. If they cannot, then they need to be rehabilitated somehow by these Western countries. If they cannot eventually, and they insisted on adapting extremist thoughts and ideas and exporting the evil, uh, the evil that they were living in in their countries to the Western countries, someone should intervene. I mean, like there should be some legal procedure to limit that somehow. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you, Dalia. I'm going to get so many great clips out of this conversation. <laughs> Everything <laughs> you say is a beautiful quote. Um, I'm going to just read a message here from Alia. She says that she's too shy to speak. So uh, she just wanted to, I'm going to read from her now. I just wanted to say that I am an agnostic and half Egyptian. Curtsy and goodwill to both Yasmin and Delia. Admittedly, how Delia is now treated by Egypt is heartbreaking and causes me to be wary of my uncle. Long story why the other family members are estranged. That being said, I don't want to lose hope. I believe Dahlia's father is proud of her, and I'd like to think my dad would be also if he was alive. So I think she's just passing on her, her admiration you. to you. Thank you, Alia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope the best for you and your family. And admiration has to go to your father as well, because as we both know, in such a patriarchal society, who you have as a father really determines who you become as a young girl and as a woman. Um, Absolutely. And you were very lucky to have such a wonderful father, and that's why you've turned out to be such a wonderful human being. Um, unfortunately, you. most men, you know, are happy to take on the patriarchal role that the society gives them, the, the, you know, the overbearing power that they have over their wives and daughters, and, you know, in some cases, their sisters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they're happy to abuse that power that they're given. So, you know, it, it, your, your father really is, is commendable. And um, I know that he would be very proud of you today, Delia. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you. It means a lot to me seeing this. Thank you.
Um, so before we wrap up, I just want to make sure that there's nobody else uh, that has any questions for Dahlia. Okay, so Dahlia, I'm gonna give you the last word. Um, what are your final parting messages to the people of the West who are listening to this um, you know, you're, you've been through such a, a difficult ordeal right now. What can we learn from your experience and, and from your expertise? What is it that you'd like to, to share with us all? Thank you, Yasmin, and thank you for everyone who participated today and for the great questions uh, and uh, for the many ideas I came out with from this conversation, actually. Uh, but I want to end by saying we have to remain optimistic. There is there is always hope. There is yes, there is a lot of ugliness right now. There is a lot of like gloominess that's happening right now, or we're living in a lot of gloominess, but there is always hope. We should keep fighting, we should keep meeting, we should keep talking, we should keep thinking, we should I mean we should continue to exist as liberal people, as people who love peace, who love to make the world a better place and never give up in face of all the bad people who want to attack our humanity, our our existence. So, and eventually we will win. I always believe like peace wins at the end, always. Agreed, beautiful. Thank you so much, Delia. And everyone again, Delia's book is called The Curious Case of the Three-Legged Wolf, Egypt, Military, Islamism and liberal democracy. And again, she's the director of the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean studies. Um, and I will post links to Delia's Twitter, as well as to her book and her organization in the comments or sorry, in the description below. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us here today. And if you have any questions or comments for Delia that you'd like to speak to her later, I will also include her email address uh, so that you can communicate with her and share with her how grateful you are for her to be a beacon in the darkness. Uh, thank you again, Dahlia. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you thank so you much. Everyone. All right, thank take you very care, much. Everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.